وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Living in the West These series of programs are going to be looking at the Muslim minorities living in, their West, in the West uh, Their vision, the strategy of living in the West What should they do? Participate with the West? Should they go into society? We have with us Sheikh Haytham Al-Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation, an organization uh, in London, in the UK, which aims to find some solutions to the problems uh, of the Muslims in the West. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before we go into the topic in, in a bit more detail, Sheikh, we know this topic is a very large topic. You've got policy makers, you've got think tanks who are looking to finding solutions. But the actual vision is something that the Muslims have left alone. We've not really gone into it and it, it, it explored it. How is it important? Why is it so important for us, Sheikh? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. First of all, you rightly said that this is a big topic, a huge topic. We cannot tackle it in this uh, series of programs, nor we can tackle it in this capacity. Mm -hmm. However, we would like to provide ideas for Muslims living in the West so they can take and they can comprehend on and they can think of and maybe they can expand. And of course they can comment, correct, etc. Uh, the relationship between uh, Islam and uh, other religions such as Christianity, uh, other systems such as secularism, democracy is uh, or is on stake these days, mm -hmm. especially post 9-11. And Muslims, it is very vital for Muslims to have a global strategy in terms of the relationship between Islam and the West. And once we want to formulate a global strategy between, uh, in terms of the relationship between Islam and uh, the West, we have to take into consideration the Muslims living in the West. Also, or vice versa, Muslims living in the West once they want to formulate a strategy, they have to take into account the global Islamic strategy, if there is one. And actually they cannot, or maybe uh, we can say that it will be very difficult for them to draw a proper strategy without having a global strategy. So all are linked together and all feed each other. And we have to start somewhere in order to provide a global strategy for Muslims in general and for Muslims uh, in the West in particular. This is one important point. The second important point is now we are Muslims and we are following the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he received a revelation he had a strategy. Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed a strategy to him. Allah Jalla wa Ala taught him a strategy. He was not giving just a da'wah in general without having a strategy, without knowing what he wants to achieve. And we can summarize his strategy at this moment in by saying two points. Although I know we need to elaborate on this more mm -hmm. in the future, but let us, uh, let us summarize the strategy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into two points. He was calling people to establish Tawheed. And this is very clear. This is, the, this is the aim of the Quran. This is the aim of any revelation. Mm -hmm. And Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran that he never sent a messenger except to teach people La ilaha illallah. 
and all the prophets received the same message. Now, to establish the ibadah of Allah Jalla wa ala or to establish Tawheed. We can say that establishing Tawheed can be classified into two types. Establishing Tawheed on a personal level and establishing Tawheed on a state level. Establishing Tawheed in your personal life. Mm-hmm. But you are not an isolated person living alone without living in a society. What about the society? We need to establish Tawheed in the society, which is, we can say that establi- we can say that it means establishing Tawheed on a state level, mm-hmm. on a society level. So these two levels are included in the principle of Tawheed, which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called for. And that's why a person in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told him, what are you calling for? He's a kafir, normal mushrik. What are you calling for? He said, I'm calling for la ilaha illallah. He said, Arabs will never submit to this easily. Because this Arab person, who was mushrik, mm-hmm. he knows what does la ilaha illallah mean. It means that you have to change all of your life as an individual, as a member on the society. You have to change your life on a personal level. You have to change your life on a social level. You have to change your life on a kinematical it's, it's level. It's a comprehensive, comprehensive vision, really. It is a comprehensive change. It changed the whole life. Mm-hmm. So that's why this Arab person realized that this is difficult. This is a difficult mission that the Prophet ﷺ is trying to achieve. Anyway, this is the first point that the Prophet ﷺ, sorry, or the second point that the Prophet ﷺ, he has a vision. He has, a, or he had a strategy. And he was working according to that strategy. For example, when the Prophet ﷺ went to the Qaba'il, the tribes, when they used to come to Hajj. Mm -hmm. And he sort of uh, lost the hope, almost. We cannot say that he lost the hope completely, but he almost lost the hope that the people in Mecca can establish what he wants to establish. Mm -hmm. So he used to visit the tribes that they come to Mecca in order to perform Hajj. And he used to tell them, من يؤويني حتى أبلغ دعوة الله Who will endorse me so I can call for Allah Jalla wa ala and pass the message of Allah Jalla wa ala. And that's why when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina he, when he migrated there he was not just as a prophet but he was a prophet and he was a leader and he was what? the Khalifa of the Muslims at that time. So, there was a change on a political level, on a social level, on, and on an individual level. And this is a very important point, because many people, when they talk about this issue, they go into too many extremes. Either they say that the mission of the Prophet ﷺ to attain, to attain social change, or to attain individual change or to attain political change. Actually, as a matter of fact, the Prophet ﷺ wants to achieve in all these aspects, on all these dimensions and all other dimensions because Islam, what is Islam? Islam is to submit to the will of Allah ﷺ, to live by the will of Allah ﷺ, means to live by the will of Allah ﷺ in your personal life in your individual life, in your economical life, in your political life, in your social life, in all aspects. And this is the vision, or this was the vision of the Prophet ﷺ at that point. So this is, as we said, in brief. Of course, we need to elaborate on this in the future. Okay, now, you've given the the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. So we know there's a vision, and many people accept this, that there's a vision. The problem that I put to you, Sheikh Haytham, is that many people go in different directions with this vision. As a Muslim community, for example, some people may go to an opposite direction and say this is a vision. This opposite direction, this pulling apart, is this 
good? Is this allowed? Actually, actually, you are right. Uh, this is another important point, uh, which is the 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 need for vision unifies Muslims and put them together. Imagine a situation where Muslims in Britain. Let okay. us talk about Muslims in Britain, as I came from Britain, and every group has its own vision, and it's going to a different direction. And in many cases, those, those different visions are contradictory visions and are not considered to be complementary visions. If they are complementary visions, then yes, we can accept that. But because we do not have a unified vision, we are not achieving as we should achieve. Not only that we are not achieving as we should achieve, but in many cases we are contradicting each other. Take for example, in the West in general, and in Britain in particular, there is a discussion about the need for faith-based schools. Schooling system, where to go faith-based, private, or Islamic style schools. Or, or, yeah. or state schools. Mm -hmm. Now this is a simple matter, I'm giving it as an example. Mm -hmm. Many people work for faith-based schools and they are trying to uh, have Muslim schools funded by the state. Mm -hmm. Now many Muslims believe that no, we should not go for this because this is segregation. We are living in ghettos if we do that. We should send our children to state schools. And even, not only it is a matter of opinion, they believe in that, but even some Muslims, when they start lobby the government and start uh, take steps towards achieving this goal, the other people who do not believe in that goal may work against them and may go to the government telling the government that, listen, we are Muslims and we don't like this. We don't want this and this is against our Islam. Take the other example, a very famous example in Canada in 1996. Muslims were marching for having the personal law embedded within the Canadian judicial system through arbitration. Arbitration is uh, a legal uh, instrument that mm. is acceptable by the Canadian system and as well as many European systems and in America as well. Mm. Arbitration. And many uh, minorities and many groups are using it. In fact, many normal people are using it because it helps them in achieving what they want to achieve in a very short period of time and it facilitates many things for them in their life. Okay. Uh, just let me complete this. Okay. Many Muslims were marching for this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many Muslims were marching okay. against this mm -hmm. until the government took a decision to abolish that and to stop that and they said, we don't want that. The Muslims who were marching against that, they said, oh, they are going to bring Sharia and to implement Sharia in Canada. And then we will see that Muslims, uh, that uh, people will be stoned and Muslim or uh, thieves will have their hands cut and so on. This is Sharia. And then they said also that we in Sharia, men are given double of what women are given. Mm. So we don't want this. So they were marching against that. These visions are contradictory visions. No, no complimentary. That's why, They're contradict not complementary. Not complementary visions. Mm. That's why we need to have a unified vision. We need to ha have a unified strategy. Okay, this issue of a unified strategy, we're going to look into in more detail uh, after the break. We're going to take a short break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Uh, Sheikh, just before the break, uh, you spoke about uh, these strategies, working together, not working opposite. Now, some people say, some thinkers, shall we say, say that no, let the Muslims work. Let them go out there, have individual visions and strategies. Let them just go and do things. Let's be moving. Let's be active. What do you say to this kind of call? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, I disagree that some thinkers uh, do say this. Maybe some individuals, some du'at, yes, uh, say this. I have heard that from some du'at, but not some thinkers, because this is well established. Any community, any ummah, any nation, they have to work according to a strategy. They have to have a unified vision. Uh, see, if we have different visions, mm-hmm. then we will be moving into different directions and we will go nowhere. And we gave some examples. L- let me give you one more example. Mm-hmm. Take the issue of political participation. And you know, there is a big sort of, there is a big fuss about it. A big the, taboo sometimes with, yeah, the, with the Muslims. Yeah, big taboo yes. okay, for Muslims in the West. Mm-hmm. Do we participate? Shouldn't we participate? This is a kufr, this, we are participating in democracy, etc. And many people go too far and thinking that the only way for them is to participate. Now, I'm not talking about the legal issue with regards to participation, whether it is allowed, it is not allowed, it is wajib, it is haram, no. But take for example this issue. If uh, we Muslims uh, decided to support, for example, in the UK, support, they decided to support labor. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a deal with labor that we will support you, but we have our own needs. And you have to fulfill our needs. Mm-hmm. And this is what we are supporting you. Then, if the two million voters, or maybe the two million Muslims, of course, not all of them are, uh, eligible to eligible vote, to mm-hmm. vote. Mm-hmm. so you can say maybe we have like a half million okay. okay eligible to vote if they have a unified decision in terms of voting and ho- whom to vote for then i think they will have an impact now i know when you talk about labor government and conservative government many people feel oh labor government who send uh, their troops to Iraq to kill our brothers and sisters in Iraq and to kill our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, etc. But take another example. And I had this discussion with some Muslim individuals in Britain. They said that in one of their areas, without naming that area, they had an, uh, the MP... Uh, the member of parliament there. Yeah. yeah, the member of parliament from BMP. British National Party. Which is a racist organization against... Very racist organization and against foreigners right in general right. mm-hmm. and especially against Muslims yeah, the, in particular. They've actually got an attack on the Muslims at present. Yes. yes. And he said, now they won. What, or he won. What can we do? I said, this is the point what we are talking about. Because, see, it, at the end of the day, someone might say all of them are bad. Yes, but all of them, you cannot say that all of them in the same level. Mm -hmm. Some of them are better than others. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, do not feel that much hostile against Muslims. This is very simple. We know that. This is well known. So, in that situation, what shall we do? Of course, we need to unify an opinion Mm -hmm. in terms of this participation. In some other countries, for example, in some other European countries, some Muslims took the decision that they should boycott elections and voting, not because they believe that it is haram, but they want to send a message to the government that if you do not provide for Muslims and you do not fulfill our needs as Muslims, we will not participate and we will boycott that. And this will have an impact. Imagine in that situation, Muslims were divided. Some of them, after taking the decision that this is the best for Muslims to boycott uh, elections, some of them said, no, 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 we should participate and we should vote and uh, go into that process. What will happen? The power of that decision will become less Mm -hmm. and they will not have that much impact. And this is uh, very clear. So are you you saying now, uh, not looking just at the voting, 
but many other issues. There's loss of opportunities here for the Muslims by not having one unified strategy. This is this may bring us to the other point, which is if we do not have uh-huh. a vision, first of all, we may lose so many opportunities that can exist or that existed at a specific time, but because we were not looking at these opportunities because we lack the vision, we lost these opportunities. Take, for example, uh, the issue of Sharia and Muslim personal law to be recognized officially within the judicial system of British or Western governments. Many European countries, they didn't feel that much hostile against Muslims as they feel now, I mean, post 9-11 and maybe post 7-7 in London Mm -hmm. and post some recent events in Canada and France and uh, Germany and uh, Holland as well. But before that, if we as Muslims were unified in terms of our vision and we said that, yes, we are living here, it became our country, whether we like it or we don't like it, it is our country. Now we need to achieve something. And we are marrying. And many Muslims are divorcing. The issue of inheritance law, the issue of uh, custody, children custody. What do we do about these things? This just only the personal law, even part of it. We need to approach the government or the governments and lobby them and influence them or convince them that they have to cater for these basic needs. Imagine that Muslims were united on such vision and they went to these European countries, for example, or governments, to France, to Britain, to Canada, or even to America and other countries. I believe that they could have achieved that. Uh, Take, for example, the issue of halal meat. It's a very simple example. Mm -hmm. Now, in all these countries, they provide for halal meat. Although, traditionally Mm -hmm. uh, and historically, maybe slaughtering halal meat, uh, slaughtering animals, uh, is banned because of animal rights and it is illegal. But because Muslims were unified and all of them were marching for this, asking for this, then they could achieve it. Of course, someone might say, yes, because they got some support from the Jewish uh, community. Mm -hmm. It is true that they got that support from the Jewish uh, community, community, but the point is they knew what they want to achieve, so they found the facilities that prov- that enable them to achieve what they want to achieve. So similarly, if we want to achieve having this Muslim personal law recognized officially within the Western judicial system, then we could have uh, established some links with some other uh, groups who are aiming for the same aim or for a similar aim, and then all of us could work together in achieving that. Okay, so now this loss of opportunity is quite clear, but do you think this leads to other people making the agenda for the Muslims? For example, other people with other strategies are guiding us because we don't have a vision? That is true. That is absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Because if they, if they see us uh, lacking a unified vision, a clear vision, then they will put their own vision for us. And this is what we see in many European countries. Because now, in some countries, they are pushing for assimilation. Yes, that's right. Yes. Like France. Mm-hmm. Because they have not seen the French Muslim people coming up with their own strategy, convincing strategy. And moreover, Muslims in Britain are facing the same challenges. Mm-hmm. And Muslims in some other parts of the world are also facing some other similar challenges. Maybe we can elaborate on this more once we start talking about the details of the strategy or the vision. Jazakallah, Sheikh Haytham. That's that's excellent. I think we're going to look more in detail at what the actual vision is in the next program. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, first program. Please 
tune back into us for the rest of this series, a very important series on living in the West. I'll leave you with that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.